Put this up here. All right. Click. We're at the uh, we're at the conclusion of First John. That's that's in verse chapter five, verses thirteen through twenty one. And we began looking at that last week, so I'll just repeat a little bit of that, and then we'll carry on. In verse thirteen, you have the purpose of the letter summarized, just as he does in John chapter twenty, verse thirty one. And John, he wants his readers to know that contrary to whatever suggestions the false teachers may have made, he wants his readers to know this orthodox community to which he's writing. He wants them to know that they have eternal life. They're not to allow those self-proclaimed spiritual heavyweights to rob them of their peace and security. He wants them to know that they are of God, they are in Christ and that they have this peace and security. And then in 14 and 15, he speaks of assurance regarding prayer. And this idea, see, being in Christ, being children of God, they can be bold in approaching God and confident that he will favorably hear whatever they ask according to his will. See, so that's that, that large condition there that there are things that God is doing, and there are some things he has conditioned on prayer. There are other things that he has not. So if we ask something within that is according to his will, within the things that he has left for uh, the prayer option, if I can put it that way, if we ask in that, in that thing, we can know that he hears us favorably. And as I said in the discussion, we are talking about chapter 3, verse 22, to be effective, prayer, it's not simply that it has to be within this stream of God's will. But there are other conditions of effective prayer, and he just assumes that these are part of Christian prayer. But it has to be, our prayer has to be offered by one who's living in faithfulness, you know, in covenant loyalty. A rebel cannot, I mean, a rebel can pray, but can have no expectation that God is going to heed that or, or hear that prayer favorably. And the and one praying must have proper motives, meaning out of a sincere heart, right? Not to be seen by others. As Jesus says in Matthew, if you're praying for show, well, that doesn't mean anything to God. So it has to have proper motives. Uh, one has to be praying with a desire to glorify God rather to in, than to indulge in selfishness, as James, you see in James chapter 4, verse 3. You don't get because what? You, you're just praying like, you know, Lord, give me this, give me this, give me this. And so there are these other understood conditions of prayer, and John simply assumes these are part of a Christian prayer, but he says, being children of God, they can be bold in approaching God and confident that he will favorably hear whatever they ask in his name. And since God favorably hears such prayer, they and we can be confident that we have what we've asked for. Now, that's important. I mean, that, that is something that is, you know, when we're praying, it's not, uh, you know, like, well, I'm just saying things. You see, we are in communion with God. And we can be confident as children of God. We can approach him with confidence. And we can be confident that the things that we ask according to his will, that he hears those things favorably, and we have them. And now, he then follows that, and he says in 5, 16, and 17, if anyone sees his brother sinning a sin not unto death, he will ask and he will give him life to the ones who sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that you should make a request about that. All wrongdoing is sin, yet there is sin not unto death. So in light of the efficacy of prayer according to God's will that he's just reassured them of, John says that if they see a brother, and implicit in that is, or a sister, if they see a brother or a sister committing a sin not unto death, they need to pray to God and God will give that sinner life. Now it's difficult to know what does John mean by his references to a sin not unto death and a sin unto death. Now, many different interpretations have been offered in the history of Christian theology. 
Okay, so what is that? That is a signal. When you see that and you see so much difficulty and so many people who have studied and thought wrestling with something, that's a sign that an extra dose of humility is needed. Okay, when you approach texts like that and you see in the history of interpretation that many great you know, uh, devout scholarly people have wrestled and said, mm, I don't know about this and different interpretations, you need to tread lightly. Okay, that doesn't mean I'm not going to tell you what I think. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what I think, but I'm footnoting that. You go, okay, you register that and say, all right, this is a, this is a difficult verse to understand, but let me tell you what I think, it, I think it means. My understanding is that a sin not unto death is a sin committed by a faithful Christian, one who is walking in the light and who is thus penitent. Okay, we know that, we know that Christians sin, right? I mean, John has has said this expressly. There's nobody who doesn't sin. And so I think it's a sin that is committed by a faithful Christian, one who's walking in the light, and thus who is penitent. That sin is forgiven, and therefore is not in itself spiritually fatal because that sin doesn't separate him or her from God. It is not unto death in that sense. And so the question becomes, all right, if the sin is forgiven and it's not unto death and because it's forgiven and does not separate that sinner from God, well, then why does God need to give life to the one who commits it? What's that about? In what sense then? If what I'm saying is correct, then in what sense does God give that person life? Now, the fact that sin is forgiven doesn't mean that a sin can pose no danger to one's spiritual life. You see, there are other things going on in sinning. As I. Howard Marshall says, sin is dangerous because it is the characteristic of life apart from God. You see, that's bound up with sin. That's the nature of sin. Sinning has the potential for corroding one's faith and ultimately pulling one away from Christ, even beyond the point of no return. It is a tool of the devil. That's what it is. It is a tool of the devil that can desensitize one to the will of God. You know how the violation of your conscience can facilitate its further violation. Right? So I may do something, and I violate my conscience, and I'm penitent, and my sin is forgiven, but the effect of that can linger. That's why Paul is so concerned in different letters that you not violate your conscience and why he takes that so seriously. And that's why he says that, listen, you as a brother or sister cannot sin in your brother's face and get them to run ahead of their conscience. I shouldn't say sin in your brother's face. You shouldn't do something that is optional that they believe is wrong and then you encourage them, see, to violate their conscience. Well, why does he care so much about that? Because it can be very dangerous to violate your conscience. It can desensitize you and can begin you on a road that pulls you from the Lord. So it's not simply the fact of being forgiven. I think the sin is forgiven, but I think there are potential corrosive effects of sin. And that's what I think he's talking about praying. One who sees a faithful brother or sister sinning, sinning, committing a sin, needs to pray that God will protect that brother or sister's faith from any lingering, corrosive effect so that that, that sin will not become a step on the road to apostasy. I think that's what he's talking about. I say it's difficult. Many people would disagree with that. But I think that's what he's saying, is that when you see a brother, a faithful brother, sinning a sin, though it's forgiven, you need to pray that God will protect that brother or sister from the corrosive effect of that sin so that it not become a step that pulls the brother or sister away. And God will answer that prayer, the result of which is that the sinning brother or sister will be given resurrection life at Christ's return. You see, and he will give him life. He will give him life how? He will give him resurrection life. You see, he will be part of that. I think that's what, what's going on. Now, John simply notes that there is a sin unto death there is a sin unto death and he says he's not saying that one should make a request about that okay there is a sin unto death now i think the sin unto death is a knowing 
willful, open-eyed, final rejection of Christ. It is unto death in that the person who does that, the person who makes this knowing, willful, open-eyed, final rejection of Christ, that person is beyond repentance. That person's repenting apparatus is non-functional. He is beyond, because he knows and has chosen open-eyed. I'm not talking about fooled, weakness, or any of that. But this is a knowing, willful, open-eyed, final rejection of Christ. That person is in that demonstrating that he or she is beyond repentance. Proof that the repenting apparatus is non-functional. I think you see this same concept. In Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 6, Hebrews chapter 10, 26 to 31, I think this is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's, I, I think it's all the same concept, that there is a point of deadness to God and willful rejection that a person can reach that they, they will not come back. They simply will not. And I think that's what he's talking about here. God will not give blessed resurrection life to a person in that state because God will not give blessed resurrection life to the impenitent. He's not going to do that. So why should you be praying for him to do what he's not going to do? He will not give resurrection life to the impenitent. So, so John, he doesn't advocate prayer in that case. But notice he doesn't forbid it. This is a distinction. He doesn't forbid it. He simply doesn't advocate it, and that's significant because we often can't tell, often if ever, can we tell if somebody has in fact gone over that line. We may look and say they look like that, but we can't tell really if they've, ever, if they've gone over that line. So if we pray for somebody who is in fact over that line, we're not sinning. We're not violating John's words. He didn't say, don't pray for them. He just says, I'm not advocating prayer for that. That's why I think it's significant. Let me read you what Craig Blomberg says, a New Testament scholar. He says, what John writes is that he is not saying that people should pray in those situations rather than saying that they should not pray. In other words, he's just not discussing the situation of what to do with people who have so hardened their hearts that they will never repent. But since we don't have God's ability to know who, who may have crossed such a line, we must pray for everyone on the assumption that they may still have a chance. See, I think that's the idea, and I think that's why that distinction is important, is that conceptually... There are people who are beyond that line and who will not repent, and God will not give them resurrection life. Why? Because he hates them? No, because they'll never repent. But in terms of our praying, we don't have God's insight. So if we pray for somebody who is, in fact, over that line, we're not violating what John said. So we're not doing wrong and not sinning. And Blomberg would say we should pray for everybody, no matter how it looks, because we simply don't know. We can be fooled that somebody may, may be over that line. Now, the implication is that some or all of the heretics are in that category. You remember the, con the context is he's writing, right? So John's implication here is that some or all of those heretics are in that category, and he wants to keep the gap between his readers and the false teachers. He wants to keep that gap clear and wide to minimize the false teacher's opportunity to adversely affect his audience. He wants them to recognize, listen, there, there is something. There is a point of no return. And there are people for whom I don't advocate praying. And so he says, look, there is a chasm between you and these false teachers. See, they're not mere sinners in the faith, as we all are. Right? They're not mere sinners in the faith. They're enemies of the faith. They're enemies of the faith who have rejected God's forgiveness available in Christ and who are seeking to lure other people to death. 
So I think John implicit in what he's saying, he wants them to recognize there is this gulf and this chasm. And then in 18 to 20, we get these, these uh, three Christian affirmations, three things that we know. He says in 5, 18 to 20, we know that everyone who has been born of God does not sin habitually. I won't have to go back through all that, but every, it does not sin habitually. But the, one who, but the one who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This one is the true God and eternal life. Now, John says in 18, 518, Christians, those who are in a relationship with God, do not accept sin as do the false teachers. We don't embrace sin. We don't wallow in sin. We don't live in sin. We do not practice sin as a lifestyle. Do we sin? Yes. Does John know that? Yes. But there is a distinction between sinning while you strive to follow Christ and living in sin, in rejecting his lordship. We talked about that in a number of places in the letter, particularly in chapter 3, verses 6 through 10. So Christians, those who are in a relationship with God, they do not embrace sin. They do not make peace with sin. They're at war with sin, struggling against it, rejecting it in their lives confessing it, renouncing it, getting up every time they fall and continuing toward Christ. That's different than the person who sits here and says, in essence, yeah, I know that's wrong, but I'm saved by grace. I don't care. Okay, it's different than that. And you would understand that. You understand that difference in your children, you see. You understand the difference between open rebellion and not caring and struggling, okay? And we all struggle. That's part of life here and on, in this, on this side. Now, the debate regarding the second clause, the debate regarding the second clause, but the one who, who was born of God protects him. Okay, the debate regarding that clause is whether the one who was born of God, does that refer to the Christians in the former clause? You see, he says, we know that everyone who's been born of God, well, that's referring to Christians does not sin habitually, but the one who was born of God. Well, does that refer to Christians going back here, or does that refer to Jesus? You see, and it's not easy to determine that. It's, it's not easy to decide that. If it's the former, you see, if it's the former, meaning that rather than sinning habitually, Christians guard themselves you see you can take this this uh, pronoun can be reflexive and it can mean himself instead of him and protects and guards are just different ways of translating that same word so if it, if it refers to the christians then you would understand it as but the one who was born of god the christian guards himself and the evil one does not touch him in that case the idea is similar to what you see in james chapter 4 verse 7 resist resist the devil and he will flee from you Okay, so it, may, it makes sense. It's not, see, that's certainly a possibility. And the fact Jesus is nowhere else referred to as the one who was born of God, well, that cuts in favor of that view. Now, what's being said, is it's referring to the Christian. The Christian guards himself and in that resists the devil and the devil flees from him. So it could mean that. Now, the biggest objection to that understanding to understanding here that this one, the one who was born of God refers back to the Christian, the biggest objection to that is that there's a shift in tenses. You see, the one who has been born of God to the one who was born of God. You see, in that shift in tenses, that may signify something there. And so that, coupled with the fact that Jesus is portrayed in the Gospel of John, particularly, he's portrayed there as the one who keeps the disciples safe. Well, that leads most commentators to think, that this refers to Jesus. So the one who was born of God, Jesus, protects him. In other words, does not allow the person to be overpowered by Satan. 
He protects him. In other words, that, to me, this is one of the great comforts. Like even that, that the verse about resisting me will flee, flee from you. Those who are seeking and who are penitent and who are desiring God do not have to worry that they don't have the power to overcome. God leaves us to choose. But if you choose and want to be with God, you don't have to worry that this powerful being will come and take you out and prevent you from having the desire of your heart. God is assured that's not going to happen. He will protect you and keep you from, from him from touching you in the sense meaning of overpowering you. You see, and I think that I draw great comfort from that. Now, he, he doesn't harm them. That may, that may well be further assurance to the faithful against this threat that's posed by the false teachers. So anyway, this, you see this here, and then he, then he goes in verse 19. He says, we know that we are of God. So this is the second we know. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. See, John and his readers, the faithful, the orthodox, those who accept the true confession of who Jesus is, Christians from all time, right? We're all encompassed in that. John and his readers and all Christians know they're God's children and can thus claim the promises that are connected to being of God. See, we are of God. And all of the, just think of it. We are of God and all of the promises that are associated with being of God we can claim. We also know that there are only two sides in the battle. Right? There are only two. We are of God, and we understand that all who are not Christians are under the control of the evil one. You say, oh, it's horrible. You can't say that and all that. Do you think? Look. He says, we're of God in the whole world. We and they. You see? Now, do you think that if you walked up to somebody and said, well, you're under the control of the evil one, he'd go, you know, okay, I didn't know that. No. <laughs> He's going to say, you know, you're a moron. Okay? But I, this is the reality. And that's part of, the, part of the smoothness of the enemy. Is that he bags people and they're, they're hostile about it. I don't you know, Satan, I don't you know. I mean, you see, that's part of it. But you and I who read and understand what God has revealed, we, we recognize that we are of God and you have their two sides here and that they are, they are under the control of the evil one. I mean, you see that this is part of the spiritual battle that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6, 11 and 12, 2 Timothy 2, 26. There's a battle going on and they are essentially doing the bidding. They won't know it sometimes, they may. But they'll think that they're doing something noble and all that, but they are rejecting God's gift of life in Christ. And that casts them on the other side. Then he says in 20, he says in, in, in verse 20, Christians know that the Son of God has come in the flesh. We know that. See, God has come and become the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth God the Son. He didn't just seem to be. He didn't temporarily inhabit Jesus of Nazareth. It is a true incarnation. Divinity became human in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we know that the Son of God has, become, has come in the flesh and has revealed the way to know God. He came from God and he taught us the way of salvation. He taught us that, namely that he... Through his redeeming work is the only path to the Father. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no life with God apart from Christ and the door he has opened through his blood. That's the only door. You see, and we know that. We have learned that. He came and he taught us that. Christians, having believed Christ's words, are in the Father, in that they are in Christ, who is the true God and eternal life. Now, there's some ambiguity about where does this, this one refers back. Does it refer to the most immediate antecedent? Does it refer back to Jesus Christ? I think probably. 
But you can see somebody could say, well, no, it refers back to the Father. But if you weigh that out and say, no, I think there it refers back to the Father, take heart. There are a number of other passages that expressly and clearly identify Jesus as God. Okay? So if you put this one in the ambiguous category, take heart. Okay? There are others that lack that ambiguity. All right, now he finishes 521. Finishes, you never thought you'd hear that. <laughs> but there it is, I said it. He finishes in 521. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. You see, in the false teachers, they had left the faithful Christians. They had gone out from the church and they had gone into the world because they had a false notion about Jesus Christ. They had this misunderstanding or this false idea, this lie that Jesus is not God the Son manifested in the historical person Jesus of Nazareth. So they went out from the community of faith. And just as Israel was repeatedly warned against leaving the one true God to go out after idols and against abandoning God's commandments for the permissive lifestyle of the worshipers of the false gods of the surrounding nations, right? So John speaks of joining these false teachers and accepting their theology that God doesn't really care how you live. He speaks of that in terms of going after idols. And so that's how he finishes the letter, where he's been instructing them and warning them about the dangers posed by these false teachers. He's been counteracting all of their lies, preaching to them and encouraging them, and he ends it by saying, he just says here, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Do not go out and do not follow these people because that is what they're doing. And you think we'll take a breath? We will not. Second John. 